Well, we're here this morning in Rupert Sheldrake's library um, to have a discussion with Rupert and the uh, president of the network, Peter Fenwick, uh, about um, the theme of the annual meeting, the challenge of dogmatism and fundamentalism in science and religion. Uh, I wanted to start by uh, looking at the background of um, some of the ideas and the situation we find ourselves in um, from the 17th century, the development of the scientific and materialist worldview in the 17th century. Uh, and uh, ask Rupert first um, how he sees um, the importance, the developments of that time in relation to the situation in which we find ourselves now. One of the first things that happened in, in the foundations of modern science in the early 17th century was a deliberate s uh, separation of the subjective realm from the so-called objective. So what Galileo said that what he called secondary qualities which is sounds, smells, colours, what philosophers now called qualia, the, the qualities of experience, um, were not part of the objective world. They were produced by our minds, by our subjective realm. Um, and that that was separate from the realm that science investigated. Descartes made this separation much more extreme um, a decade or two later, creating what's called Cartesian dualism, there's the realm of matter, which is extended in space and you can measure and quantify. That's what science investigates. There's the realm of consciousness or mind, which is human minds, angels and God, which is non-physical, not in space and time, and totally separate. And science has confined itself since then to the material world, which means, of course, it has no explanation for consciousness. And this is still one of the biggest problems in, in science. I have a seven-year-old godson who sent me an email this morning saying, uh, Dear Rupert, I was awake last night because I realised I didn't understand what is it that makes my arm go up when I decide to raise my arm or makes my eyes blink. Is it the mind yeah, yeah. and how does it work? Yes. Well, a very reasonable question. Mm. Mm. Um, I've had to email him back this morning saying no one knows. Um, this really is one of the big unsolved problems of science. Yes, and there's also the desacralization of nature is it, at the same time, which is part of the same process. That's right. Mm. It means withdrawal of, of soul and spirit from the whole natural world. So the, the realm of spirits and God and so on is supernatural, beyond nature, not in the physical world at all. That means that the whole earth and the whole universe simply become dead, inanimate matter in motion described by the laws of physics. Yes, and we could go off in that direction, but it's just to, to set that kind of context. Yes. Peter, how, how do you see the influence of the 17th century on our current view? Uh, it's, it's had an absolutely profound effect in structuring science. Um, I was always brought up to look at the objective, the primary qualities of Galileo, and consciousness was never mentioned uh, in my early science courses. What we were talking about was levels of alertness. And if you dared to mention consciousness, it was absolutely and totally wrong. And the, the way that you were brought up was always to look at the objective. Uh, you weren't allowed any feelings at all in your science. And the question is, where did this come from? Why couldn't scientists be creative and express their feelings in, in what they did and what they wrote? And it seems to me that it goes right back to Descartes and the uh, problems that uh, science had in, in trying to distance itself from modern philosophy at that time. Montaigne was very clear. He talked about the passions of the individual, talked about the mind, he talked about the wholeness of the person. Whereas Descartes says quite clearly that he talks masked. What he means by that is that the intellect is okay, what the intellect constructs is okay, but the actual passions of the individual should never come in to these intellectual formulations. And that together with the ideas of, um, of Galileo and his primary and secondary qualities set a very rigid framework which it, with, within which science evolved. And this is one of the difficulties that we have today, trying to expand that. And there was also the whole question of liberation from um, the superstitions of medieval, the medieval church as well. So there's this liberation, enlightenment liberation, um, which, which mm. of course, one could argue maybe has gone too far now. But this was another factor, wasn't it, in, 
in, in the, the development of scientific thinking. I think so, and I think in the in the seventeenth century, after all, we have the Thirty Years' War. Descartes' vision, this vision of a mechanical universe, happened when he was a mercenary soldier in winter quarters, about to attack Prague, at, at the beginning of the Thirty Years' War, sixteen nineteen, and Protestants and Catholics were killing each other all over Europe. There was an appalling period of disruption. In England, we had the Civil War, and there was a tremendous amount of religious strife. And for a lot of people, science represented what they called the third way. It was an attempt to rise above all that into a realm of objective truth, of mathematical certainty, way beyond the realm of demagogues and religious um, orators and, and uh, enthusiasts, and um, a calm, objective world of reason. Of reason, and, exactly. And that's, mm -hmm. of course, what was so attractive to a lot of people. It did seem liberating, and it laid the foundations for the Enlightenment cult of reason and progress. Exactly, which we'll come back to. Yes, but mm. let's understand mm. that it was liberating. It was fantastic, because a lot of the superstitions, the uh, particularly the witches' trials, in which somebody would come before the court and say a baby had appeared in the milk which had gone sour, um, all that sort of rank, clear superstition could at last fall away. So it was uh, a really very powerful, powerful move in the intellectual development. Uh, of that time. And we s tend to forget that the beginnings of science were embedded in the culture of that time. And their embeddedment in the culture that we have has gone on since then. And I don't know if you were brought up, Rupert, but I was always brought up to think that science had the answer. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it could detect truth. Mm -hmm. There was no question about it. If there was a scientific fact, there was a scientific mm -hmm. fact. And we all had to believe it. And there was nothing about culture at that time. There was no way that, that we would discuss culture. In fact, it wasn't really until Thomas Kuhn came on the, on the scene mm. and pointed this out mm. to us. I mean, can, can, you, can we move on perhaps to how you became interested in this whole question of, of consciousness and, and, and how your work developed from that interest, um, Rupert? Uh, I, I started off as a biologist working on developmental biology. For reasons to do with developmental biology, I got interested in the idea of morphogenetic fields, fields that organize living organisms. I came to the conclusion that to understand how a plant grows, it's not enough just to know about genes, molecules, proteins, and, and cell biology. You need a more integrated, holistic understanding. So this idea of fields, first Thought of, thought of by me in, in connection with chemicals, molecules, crystals and plants and then animal embryos extended them to, the, to behaviour and I realised then that uh, there must be a field theory of mind as well. This got me interested in learning memory, um, behaviour, consciousness. Um, so I started as a biologist moving out from a field theory of developmental biology to a field theory of, of mind. Um, and then that led me to an interest in testing this. And there are various ways you can test this theory. Um, morphic resonance is part of my theory, the idea there's a memory in nature. Um, that means that if rats learn a new trick in one place, rats elsewhere in the world should learn it quicker. That can be tested with animals and with people, and quite a number of tests have been done. The extended mind also means that uh, when we look at something, we're connected with what we look at. And our mind reaches out through fields, and therefore we can affect what we look at. And that led me to my research on the sense of being stared at. If you look at someone from behind, they don't know you're there, can they feel it? Most people have had that experience. Experiments show that uh, people can indeed detect it. Um, and then uh, we're connected with people who we have social bonds with. Those connections endure at a distance, and I think that's the basis of telepathy. That led me to my research on telephone telepathy on, and telepathy between uh, dogs and their owners and the research on dogs that know when their owners are coming home. We'll, we'll go into a little more detail on that perhaps in a moment.